This is a plate of cut apples. I'm going to set this down for just a moment. One of the most common worries a lot of us have thanks to fear mongering on social media is that we are all ingesting microplastics from food. From using industrially made iodized salt or sugar, non-stick cookware, packaged food, people storing food in plastic containers and so on. And when you listen to all of that, it sounds convincing, right? What if I told you that while I was speaking, the amount of microplastics that settled on top of the apple pieces I just showed you from the air inside my home in Chennai is way more than all the microplastics you will ingest from all those sources influencers care you about. Meaning, microplastics are in the air we breathe. They are in the water we drink. Some places have more, some less, but they are there. And there is little you can do about it. So, should you be even more worried now? Or actually less worried? To decide whether to increase your blood pressure or lower it, let's understand microplastics first. Microplastics are plastic particles less than 5 millimeters in diameter. They come from two places. One, primary sources, where we actually need small-sized plastic particles like microbeads in cosmetics, as abrasives in toothpaste, and also other industrial uses. And these get into the environment, into water, air, etc. Because of tighter regulations over the last decade, the use of microbeads has now significantly gone down. And experts estimate that primary sources account for only 20 to 30 percent of microplastics worldwide. Two, secondary sources, where larger plastic pieces degrade into smaller ones as a result of sunlight, UV radiation, and physical wear and tear, like plastic bags, bottles, fishing nets, packaging materials, small microfibers from synthetic textiles, especially when they are washed, tire wear and tear as vehicles drive on the road, paints and coatings from every building. Secondary sources account for 70 to 80% of all microplastics. As you can see, primary sources are relatively easier to regulate. You can force industries to reduce the use of microbeads, etc. You can also incentivize research into more durable materials that don't break down into small particles. Secondary is much harder because it involves all of us, the entire global population using plastics on a daily basis and the relentless march of time and wear and tear. Secondary sources account for 70 to 80 percent of all microplastics. So the next logical question is, all this is fine, but how do microplastics get into our bodies? After all, that is the primary concern most of us have. Sure, we don't want plastic pollution like our tourists littering in hill stations, but even the person littering does not want to ingest microplastics. So let's understand all the ways in which microplastics get into our bodies. What I have done is summarized data from several research papers, all of which are linked in the description below into a priority list. Experts estimate that 40 to 50% of all the microplastics that get into your body come from drinking water. Remember that all those primary and secondary sources, industries, us washing clothes, etc. Ultimately, a lot of the microplastics we generate get into groundwater and the sea. So actually, if you use a RO, reverse osmosis filter at home whose membrane filters out anything larger than a water molecule, this will significantly cut down your microplastic intake from water. Actually, just avoiding bottled water alone can significantly reduce microplastic intake. The second largest source of microplastics is breathing. I live in a relatively greener part of the city, so I'm going to breathe in fewer microplastics. If I live in a hill station or in a village, I'm going to breathe in fewer microplastics. If I live in a busy street with a lot of vehicles, I'm going to breathe in a lot more microplastics. Breathing contributes to 30 to 40% of all the microplastics we breathe in. Remember that a lot of the microplastics we generate eventually find their way to the ocean. And some shellfish, particularly clams, mussels, oysters that we eat, 
are filter feeders. They take in a lot of water, filter out the plankton that they eat and push out the water. And that process ends up concentrating a lot of microplastics in their body. Shellfish alone contributes to 10 to 15% of microplastics humans take in. Overall seafood, regular fish are not a major source. Crustaceans like prawns, crabs, a little bit, but clams, mussels and oysters are the largest source. So if your diet is not very heavy in shellfish, this is not going to be a big factor. Which then brings us to every single thing influencers care us about. One, microwaving popcorn, using plastic containers for storage, milk packets, table salt and sugar, packaged foods in general. All of these are estimated to be less than 1% of the microplastics we consume. Yes, 1%. In short, you can just ignore all those videos. So what we have learned is that drinking water, breathing air and eating shellfish are the largest sources of microplastics that get into our body. And that brings us to the next logical question. All this is fine. Now I understand how they get in and which sources I need to pay attention to and which sources I can just ignore. But what actually happens when microplastics get into our body? What is the real health risk? First, gastrointestinal tract. A lot of the microplastics we get are from water. So that's going to go down to our gut. Now, first thing, any particle larger than 150 micrometers is excreted without any absorption. Smaller than that, there is a small risk that it can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So far, we only have rat studies where a large amount of microplastic exposure showed some effort on gut microbe health, but we do not have evidence for that in humans. In short, we've been consuming microplastics for a while now, and we have not found evidence of serious harm to the gut. That said, lab studies show that very tiny particles, nanoparticles, can cause oxidative stress, but again, we have not seen that in humans. Second, respiratory tract. We typically live in polluted Indian cities and these particles can cause irritation of the respiratory tract, coughing, wheezing, etc. We've all seen this. Spending one week in a hill station seems to clear our lungs. But again, the evidence we have is for these kinds of minor irritations and unless you are working in an environment like a factory where the concentration levels are higher, experts do not think that this is a serious risk for average people. Third, some of the molecules that can be leached from certain plastics are by themselves industrial pollutants like phthalates and BPA, etc. Influencers will use scary terms like endocrine disruptors, etc. But the evidence we have is that our exposure to them compared to other exposures is just super tiny and very insignificant. And finally, the magical scary C word, cancer. So far, we have found no evidence that microplastic exposure causes cancer in humans. Of course, we have taken rats, subjected them to an unreal amount of nanoplastics and seen the risk of tumor development go up, but no human evidence. Which brings us to a broader question. What should I do? Is this not emerging science? What if we find out 10 years later that this was a problem? Some perspective first. Plastics are absolutely critical to modern life. They are present in everything, everywhere, all at once, due to their versatility, durability, and cost effectiveness. In the medical field, you cannot imagine syringes, IV bags, prosthetics, and personal protective equipment without plastics. They ensure sterility and patient safety. Food preservation relies heavily on plastic packaging to maintain freshness and prevent contamination. Can you even think of packaging food any other way? No. In transportation, plastics contribute to lighter vehicles and airplanes, enhancing fuel efficiency and reducing emissions. Our electronics, from smartphones to computers, depend on plastic components for insulation and structural elements. Construction materials like PVC pipes and insulation utilize plastics for their durability and resistance to corrosion. Even in agriculture, plastics play a vital role in irrigation systems and greenhouse films. We live the modern lives we do because of plastics. 
eliminating plastics entirely is currently impractical as no other materials offer the same combination of benefits on such a global scale. So at best, what we can do is use a combination of intelligent policies and regulations against companies to reduce the use of microplastics, single-use plastics, etc. And think practically and mindfully about what we as individuals can do. To quickly recap, 40 to 50% of microplastics we ingest come from water. And most of that comes from bottled water. So just be mindful about how much bottled water you consume. And using RO water at home completely eliminates microplastics. If you're traveling, bottled water might be impossible to avoid. But again, don't break your head. Just remember the big picture. 30 to 40% microplastics come from breathing. And most of us do not have the ability to change where we live. We have jobs in cities, in factories, on the road. But again, for most people, we do not have evidence that this poses a significant health risk. The gases and dust particles you breathe in currently pose a much bigger risk than microplastics. So focus on that. And unless you consume a lot of mussels, clams and oysters, you have very little to worry about microplastics from food, from salt or sugar, from non-stick cookware, from microwave popcorn, from plastic containers and so on. Just don't waste your time worrying about those things. And sure, studies have found microplastics in breast milk, microplastics in our stool. But let's be clear, evidence of presence is not evidence of harm. Look, we all have limited capacity to worry. If you have a lot of money, you can outsource your worries to others. You can hire a cook and say, only organic food, only natural spring water from the Himalayas and so on, and let them worry about it. If you have money, you can move to a country like Norway with clean air, barely any factories and a lot of forests. But that is not an option for most of us. But at the same time, remember this. More money usually means the ability and privilege to worry about actually trivial things. So for the rest of us, the data is clear. The levels of microplastics we are exposed to are currently considered low by most actual experts and no direct harm to human health has been confirmed. You can, out of an abundance of caution, do simple things like use an RO filter, avoid bottled water and take more vacations in places with clean air. But even if you cannot do these things, you do not have to worry. Influencers spreading nonsensical scaremongering about trivial sources of microplastics are doing more damage to your brain and mental health than actual microplastics are. Explaining the science of food and debunking pseudoscience is hard work. So I request you to consider becoming a member of this channel. Members get to be part of a private group that will work together to dig into the science of food in far more detail and also discover the true joy of food. <laughs>